Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we ask of you to fill us with your Spirit, open our eyes, our hearts to the reaches of your Word, and especially the prayer that you taught us. Lord, we pray you bless the hearing and the preaching of your Word, and Lord, most importantly, Lord, that we will be doers of your Word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Prayer is not just confined to our Christian faith. Well, in many other faiths, um, their prayers will usually consist of a string of very complicated, uh, to them, magical words. Lah, that they say these magical, long, complicated words on a repeat mode. Repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. Like chanting and that. Lah. So in times of great distress, uh, the devotee will keep on repeating this string of magical, complicated words. Uh, and they are hoping that the deity they are praying to will grant the prayer request. Sometimes such devotees, they will shout these magical words louder, shout it louder. Maybe you make it louder, you can wake up the sleepy gods. Uh, but we come to prayer, I mean, we need to admit that there are also much uncertainty in prayers. And the question we want to ask is, what is the right formula to communicate to the gods? Prayer is uh, one of life's greatest mysteries. You see, at one end of the prayer, prayer is like shouting into the air, hoping that God will listen. I mean, you can't see him like, like if, if I'm looking at Vincent now, I, I look at him, I talk to him, I think he will respond to me. La. But can't see God. La. Just talking into the air. Uh, people outside, if they hear us pray out aloud, uh, they think that we are hearing voices. We do, la, we do. <laughs> so that's one end. And then the other end, where prayer merge, merges into love that the presence of God is so real that the Holy Spirit will touch them be filled with delight and ecstasy. There are times like that as well. But for most of us, most Christians, uh, prayer lies in between of these two extremes. Prayer is not just a mystery, but prayer is also a puzzle. I mean, if you go to any Christian bookstore, uh, Prayer has a lot of books. Uh, and you can keep on reading and reading. And all day, we, we know we need to pray. So I think when, when pastors, we told you this is a year of prayer, I think there's, there's no struggle because we know we need to pray. But to be frank, uh, just like the disciples, we know that we need some help. So uh, we, we heard that it was read in, for Matthew. We look into the same story, the narration in Luke, in slightly more context, it says this, that now Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And then Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Lord, teach us to pray. The disciples look at Jesus. So one thing they caught, a lot of things sometimes is not taught. A lot of things is, prayer is one of those things that you, you can teach it, you can preach it, but a lot of times you need to catch it. So the Lord's Prayer is a teaching, is provide us with this framework for prayer. Last week, we covered the words, uh, Our Father in Heaven, where we emphasised the Father-Son relationship between us and God and what it means to call God Father and what it means for us as children of God. This week, we will focus on the words, Your Kingdom Come. Praying to a living God who dwells in heaven, who longs for his kingdom to be established here on earth. So what are we praying for? 
What are we praying when we pray for God's kingdom to come? The words, your kingdom come, will rule out any idea of the kingdom of God purely uh, just a spiritual or a fuzzy, heavenly reality, a blurry reality. Your kingdom come will rule this out. Because the connecting words, the words after this will confirm it. Your will be done on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. We are praying for heaven to come on earth. We are praying for God's space into our earthly space. We are praying for that to happen. We are praying for the integration of God's space and our space. More context. Go back 2,000 years. The Jews during Jesus' time, they were longing. They were longing for God to send he, the promised Messiah, the son of David, the king. The, they were waiting for their true king to arrive. They were waiting for the promised Messiah to become king, to rule them. Because they have, I mean, you read the Old Testament all the way when we cross over to the New. They have been oppressed by foreign powers for very long. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, then the Persians. In between your Old Testament and your New Testament, you have the Greeks and then the Romans when we cross into the New Testament. The Jews, they had it. They, they enough. They had enough. They, they know they were fed up. They were frustrated being ruled by foreign powers, heavy taxation, uh, slavery. They had enough. They are really praying, Lord, you, send, you said your Messiah will come. Is he coming or not? When will he take over? They were expecting God, the true king of Israel, to step into their world, take authority, take power, and reclaim Israel and establish the kingdom of God. The Jews, they, what they were praying for? They were praying for exodus to happen again. They were praying for the new exodus. God had delivered them before from Egypt when they were slavery. God, can you do it? Again, this was the expectation that God will deliver them from the oppressive Romans this time. The Israelites, they were praying for freedom. Freedom from Romans and freedom from evil empires that Israel will be free to worship God without any oppression. So having known the context, the historical background, the question we ask is Jesus' kingdom message simply about national and political liberation. Western Christianity, yes, uh, we are all in and we, where we learn from, typically, by the base of us, I think we will argue, uh, no, of course not. Jesus was not into politics. We will argue that Jesus' uh, kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. Well, it's all about personal, eternal salvation. It's all about spreading the gospel, the Great Commission, and everything, yeah. But the words here are shockingly jarring to our ears at times. The words are very clear. On earth as it is in heaven. Christ's kingdom is not just a spiritual kingdom. Christ's kingdom is a physical kingdom. Our body matters. Side, um, derail a bit from the sermon. Um, three years in COVID, many churches were struggling online, YouTube, uh, taking communion by themselves. That's not God's kingdom. God's kingdom requires us to gather physically and Holy Communion to be celebrated together. The physical matters. The physical matters. Going back. You see, Jesus' first followers, the first generation of his disciples, for them, they did not for a moment, did not for a moment, they think that 
Christ's kingdom uh, will become a new religious movement. See, it never occurred to them. For those of us who, were, who are uh, um, familiar with the history of the Reformation, same. Martin Luther, would, at the beginning, he never wanted to form the Lutheran Church. He never wanted to. He was supposed to be a Reformation within the Roman Catholic Church. Very similar. The disciples, when they were following Jesus, they, they, they have no intention to start another faith. It wasn't going to be another religious movement. It wasn't about an improved spirituality. It wasn't that I'm better than you are worse. It's not that. It's not about having a better moral code. Last of all, it's not about a freshly crafted theological book more theology, more theological books and more things to read. It's, it's, it's not that. The disciples, the first disciples, they believe that the unique life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ had already turned the world from darkness to light. Already happened. The kingdom of God was there. For them, the kin with Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God was indeed here. Of course, it differed from what they, they have been praying for. They thought that it was really, you no know, God, you take it as king. But they know. They know the kingdom of God was here when Jesus arrived. But if the kingdom of God is here, we've got to ask some real questions. Huh? Well, we, we need to get real. We need to get authentic with God. If the kingdom of God is here, why is there still injustice? If the kingdom of God is really indeed here, why is there still hunger? For not in Singapore. Uh, we, we need to get hungry at times. Uh, we eat too much. Uh. But the world we know, people are still hungry. If the kingdom of God is truly here, why is there still evil? There's the songs that we sang, so nice, reminded that when Christ will return, he will wipe away every tear. Revelation 19. The disciples, they knew all this. They are not foolish. They did not, like most of us would, they did not rationalize. They did not. They did not rationalize this. Neither did they dodge these questions away. They did not say that Christ's kingdom is an individual spiritual experience, that Christ's kingdom is only in heaven. No. The disciples live with the tension. They live with the tension, with the brokenness here on earth. The disciples went on to pray, and went on praying and living the Lord's prayer. Similarly, this should be our posture as well. Live with the tension. Don't rationalize. I mean, there are many very clever uh, arguments out there, but every argument will also have its loopholes. Uh. Live with the tension. We need to be reminded that Jesus' mission in his first coming, well, he has two. We're waiting, we're living in between between the first advent and the final one. Jesus' mission in, the, in His first advent, His first coming, has been completed. Jesus already lived the perfect life that we should have lived. He bare our sins on the cross. He, he died a death that we should have died. Defeated death, resurrecting three days later. You see, Christ's work here on earth is done. Completely one perfect Sacrifice. His work is done once and for all so that we don't have to repeat them. Uh, even if we want to repeat, also can't repeat. Uh. This, this work can only be done by Christ, in Christ alone. So how do we really understand this? We put it into simple words. I give us two uh, analogies. I, I, I learned this from my favourite uh, uh, theologian, uh, N.T. Wright. Uh. He said this, that Jesus is like this uh, medical genius who discovered penicillin. And we are like doctors, we, being cured by the penicillin. Now we give out penicillin to those who need it. 
The second anal analogy he says is this. Huh? Is that Jesus is like the uh, musical genius who wrote the greatest symphony of all time. And we are the musicians. Huh? Captivated by the symphony, now we perform for the whole world to hear. Yes, the kingdom of God did indeed come with Jesus. Yes, really is. I mean, you can read that in Luke, the kingdom of God is within you, the kingdom of God is among you, but it will only fully come when we see that the whole world is healed and the whole creation gathered to sing to the Lord together. This is now or not yet. We're still waiting. But for that to happen, it must be Jesus' medicine, the penicillin from Jesus. It must be music from Jesus. It must be Jesus' music. It must be Jesus. The only way of the final, the Lord's day, the only way all this is happening, the kingdom is fully established, is that we continue to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We continue to pray this. Now we break it down on the ground more relating to us. What then might it mean? How then do we pray this kingdom prayer today? Go slowly. Eh? Because we are so familiar with the Lord's prayer that we, I think we pray this too fast. The Lord's prayer starts off with this. Eh? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. First line, we stop there. We posture ourselves as children of God. We looked up. We looked up to the face of our Heavenly Father. Look up. Next line. We commit ourselves to the hallowing of His name. It means we live our holy life, that we live set apart life, counter culture, to worship God. Look at Him, live holy life, bring glory to His name. Hallowed be your name. And then from this viewpoint, before we pray the next line, we look at the world that God had created. Around us, we look from this lens. Lord, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Our eyes now, with the lens of our Creator, we see the world through the lens of our Creator and then we feel the love of God upon seeing His creation. See, always God first. Us here, align. Look around. Feel the love when you see the creation. At the same time, feeling the heart of God, looking at the brokenness of the creation, you also feel the grief. The grief of our Creator, seeing the brokenness, the destruction that had already set into the creation. Love and grief from the Heavenly Father when He sees our world. All this will accumulate onto the cross. Love and grief coming together onto the cross. Then we pray alongside with our eldest brother, his firstborn. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we continue to pray as Jesus was praying, as Jesus was serving. We pray for the redemption of the world. We pray for the defeat and uprooting of evil. We pray for heaven and earth to be married at last. We pray for God's glory all over this world. And when we pray such prayers, we must also be prepared to live this way. See, on earth as it is in heaven, our life matters. You see, these prayers, your kingdom come. We pray this for the world. We pray this for our church. 
this is a dangerous prayer. In fact, the entire Lord's Prayer is very dangerous. See, most of us, we, when we pray, um, we just want God to come and clear up our mess and fix our problems. I mean, I pray this every day. Um. Say, so God, help me. God, help me to solve this, help me to solve that. I mean, there's so many problems we need to solve. God, will you come and solve them? But what are the problems in the church? What are the problems in the world? I think wrong question. Rephrase the question. We should be asking, who are the ones creating all the problems in the church? Who are the ones creating all the problems in the world? See, when we pray this prayer, your kingdom come. I believe the Lord will work on us first. Here first. We solve the problem at the root of our hearts. When we pray for your kingdom come, we are first praying for our hearts to be healed. We need the penicillin first. We need God's symphony first. We need our hearts to be transformed from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. When we pray, your kingdom come, we are praying for our lips to be cleansed. We are praying from Singapore, we are very prone to complain. I, I'm quite a complaint king. From complaints to compliments. Let me compliment more. Let me say good things more. From grumbling to gratitude. Your kingdom come. We are praying, Lord God, will you make us a community of kingdom bearers? We are praying, Lord God, will you make us a community of healed healers? We are praying, that, Lord God, will you make us a joyous orchestra to make music unto you? We are truly praying, Lord, will your kingdom come upon our church, upon our world. Your kingdom come. bring down all the way to a personal level. How do we pray for ourselves? Uh, some confession. Uh, when I was growing up as a Christian, as a youth and as a young adult, these words, uh, uh, your, you know, Christian youth and young adults, we, we, we know how to take scripture, then we make them into a joke. Uh, then we make fun of one another. But this is what I, I did when I was young. I said, your will be done on this word. Uh, uh, I use it as words of resignation. <laughs> you see, I mean, we will face problems in our whole life, whether young or old. When we face problems, and then I, you know, I don't, I don't want to solve the problem. I don't care, really, like, like you're solving. I don't care. Really. I walk away. I shrug my shoulders. Ah, I don't care. Ah, Lord, your will be done, la. <laughs> You know, this is what I did la, when I was young. <laughs> this is a quitting attitude. La. Uh, when things are not going according to my plan, I pangkang, uh, I quit. Uh, I don't care. Really. I leave it to God. Uh, see, we, we, we can misuse those words that have been released. Uh, I love the words. Uh, it brings a lot of, of healing. Uh, when the words were released on Matthew 11, uh, 28, uh, uh, suddenly I pray, God help me. <laughs> the problem solved. Uh, I look at, because I can't reach my phone. I don't touch my phone during service, but the, the, oh, nowadays all the, the smartwatch will tell you all the alerts. Uh. Oh, one problem solved. <laughs> but we can misuse the words that have been really, oh, your yoke easy means you don't care, you don't work. Uh. <laughs> Same thing, I also misuse this, uh, the Lord's Prayer. I don't care, uh, Lord, your will be done. Uh. I don't care anymore. I don't want to work. Leave it to God. Why? Who is our God? <laughs> Our God is not some remote, uh, watching with my girls now, uh, this uh, Percy Jackson, uh, all, on the, all, all on the Greek mythology. Uh. Thank God our God is not like that. Uh. Horrible. <laughs> our God is not some remote God sitting elsewhere, don't care, having emotional mood swing, uh, a detached God from the, from the world. 
Our God is not in there. Our God is not Zeus, la, Arius, la, Hades, all the nonsense. You read all those things. Our God is not in like that. Our God is a God who wants to involve us, all of us, in His work of healing the world. He wants to heal the world. He wants to heal His church through us. We are the hands and the legs. So this my boy, chap attitude, Leo. <laughs> it's not the way to pray these words. Same words, but it's a physical, it's important. I was trying to teach a young pastor last night about face to face communication. Don't do things by text uh, because physical tone, all this in, is important. Uh. Same words are uh, your will be done. Uh. I can, your will be done. Uh, uh, and your will be done. Same words. Uh, whole lot different meaning. Your will be done. It's a risky and crazy prayer of submission. We've been praying this. This is a prayer of us submitting our will to God. Bishop Kwan, I think in my ordination training, he need to teach us on canonical obedience. He's not here, so I can't say <laughs> He also wants to give us a break uh, because too many lectures and training until our eyes also want to close. Uh. Very easy one, he said. Canonical obedience, very easy one. You've got Holy Spirit, you will submit. You cannot submit, no Holy Spirit. Yes, be sure we understand. Okay, go for a break. Uh. That's Bishop sure Kwan, right? It's a crazy prayer, you know, your will be done. Us denying ourselves Taking on the burden of doing the will of our good Father. Your will be done means we surrender ourselves to the will of God and allow Him to heal us first. Allow Him to transform us. You see, when life circumstances are challenging, and they will be, the world is broken, when our plans are failing, they will fail because we don't have full, complete wisdom. We don't have the perfect plan. Our plans will fail. We still pray, Lord, may your will be done. We surrender ourselves to the almighty God of the universe. Recognize that we are fragile. We recognize that we are finite. We open ourselves for God's love, God's grace, and even God's discipline to shape us, to mold us. For what? For His kingdom come. For His kingdom purposes to be established here on earth. So for us, simple, even more simple question, if I can reduce this sermon to just uh, 30 seconds, I will say, what does kingdom come mean to us in our daily lives? How we spend our money, how we spend our time, this will let us know, this will let myself know how am I praying this prayer and how we pray. By hearing our prayers, we, we know uh, how are we praying your kingdom come. So this year, we are emphasizing on prayer. So this is a very good juncture here to address this. How do we pray here on earth? Your on earth as it is in heaven. You see, prayer is more than an activity of your mind, heart and soul. Prayer is, prayer is not just your inner life. It's much more than that. Because if you say prayer is your inner, inner life, a lot of things that we are doing contradicts it, you know. Prayer involves your, your body, your body, flesh and blood. Our, the faith that we have uh, is a resurrection faith. And one day, we will all be resurrected full body. This earth matters. Our body matters. No? Ours is not some iffy, miffy, fairy tale story. No? Our Lord will come back here on earth. The physical matters. The physical matters. On earth as it is in heaven. For example, on your sacraments. We have baptism. Does, is baptism important? You sure it is? No? Instituted by Christ. Very, very important. Is Holy Communion important? Very. I, I mentioned this to the Chinese con congregation 
last week. Uh, I, 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 I cringe uh, if, I, if, if, I, if I hear uh, those uh, churches, that the pastors will say, oh, on your way out, please take the Holy Communion pack, uh, take it for the whole week, uh, Monday to Friday. If you need three per, three per uh, uh, a day, uh, take 20, uh, one of them. Uh, and you go back, like vitamin C, uh, then you pop in. Uh, this kind of church, you go and you run and uh, you run. Sacraments. Sacraments, our sign for inward faith. Your, the physical matters. The, these are physical acts of prayer. So for us here, I think uh, St. John Chapel is chairs, no pews. But you go to, you go to c- c- cathedral, true light, or those churches with pews, come to confession, the lady will tell you to kneel. <laughs> you kneel throughout. Kneel. Then when do you kneel? Sit, stand. I was talking to a non-Christian trying to share the gospel with him, invite him to come to church. He said, my la, go to church, very boring. You know, stand, sit, kneel. He said, wow. So even the non-Christians knew that coming to church is physical. <laughs> sit, stand, still. <laughs> Prayer is more than just an inner life. Prayer involves your whole entire being. Some of us like to stand and pray. I, I, I like because if I sit too long, I will sleep. Some of us like to lift up our hands to pray. Some like to clap their hands together, you know, form that everything all whole, some like that, you know, some like this. Some walk, I, I like to walk and pray. Some of us run and pray. I, there are days that I, I need to clear my mind and go for a good run, usually on Monday, and to clear up and just to pray. See, prayer is quite a physical sport. No? It's really quite a physical sport. It is. Sometimes prayer meeting, we, we have the whole church to just keep walking, uh, keep walking, touching every chair as a sign of faith. It doesn't really help us in our prayer. We need that, that, that tactile, the physical action to help us to pray. See, our bodily action reflect our inner reality. Our external action can also help us to stir up our internal emotions towards God. For example, uh, not every day we, we wake up, especially on Sunday. Uh, not every Sunday you wake up, you, your, your mood is totally aligned to pray, to praise God. Uh, even sometimes, uh, I don't know about Ellie, maybe Ellie always ready. Right? <laughs> but maybe there are times you come to church, and even you are the song leader, you are like, uh, today I don't feel like it. Uh. I mean, of course, then uh, you fake it until you make it. Uh. <laughs> but, yeah. See, this word, you fake it until you make it. And this word, if I remember, it's come from C.S. Lewis. Uh, yeah, it was training. I can't remember the context where I read it. But it works, you know. You know why or not? Not say you fake, fake. Lah. I mean, today's generation, you still authentic. Why, why? Your inner reality have not wake up, engine or not, it's still all cold. You take your guitar, you strum the first chord, open your mouth, cook it a bit, open your mouth, lift up your hearts to praise the Lord. When you say words, and then here we lift up our hands, here not ready, but your body actions, you fake it to you. You see what happened? Your bodily actions stir up. So I, I, when I was, uh, I'm a youth, youth pastor for many years. I was talking to youth. Pastor, I don't feel like praying today. No, but I must come to God. As to, and today I, I'm frustrated, I'm inside, I'm moody. You know, Teenagers, uh, I got two at home. Uh, oh, teenagers, a lot of mood swing on. So today, no mood, no mood, no mood. Don't disturb me, don't disturb me. Then when they come to church, they worship God. Uh, like that one. Jesus is alive. Jesus, you are good. Oh my goodness, I'm not so sure that Jesus is good and, and he's alive. I mean, the young people, they, they like, this is, this is who I am. Uh. I come to God as I am. Um, so no. <laughs> Try and lift up your hands. You shift, the, you shift the internal reality. Outwards appearance helped. Our external actions will stir up your internal reality. And we know this. We know this when two or three are gathered and pray. I want to talk about praying alone and praying together. Yes, it is important. You see, when we talk about this inner, inside, inside, my, we focus that prayer is only an individual thing and a lone thing, only the heart, mind, and soul, only like that. 
Then we sometimes neglected that together. You see, praying alone and praying together, both are required, both are important. Talk about alone first. Alone is helpful because the Lord is very clear. He said, you go to your secret prayer closet and you pray inside there. You build up your personal intimacy with God. Very, very important. Sharpen, tune your wire, your personal devotion. Important. Must do. Every day must do. Praying together, however, the church, I think, this is a lament. Uh, uh, over the last 200 years, one very important uh, teaching of a church has eroded. Uh, the theology, the doc doctrine of the church. Maybe we emphasize so much. Uh, the Reformation is so wonderful uh, by Christ alone, by faith alone, by Scripture alone, uh, the glory of God alone, the five solas. I mean, we're so focused on that. Then we, we, we move so much into individual. We, the role of the church, the importance of the church, slowly just in, in eroding. Uh, there's a revival ongoing, but I think it will take a, a few more generations for that to be restored. Praying together strengthens our faith. It's like putting burning coals together. You see burning coals, huh? they're all burning, right? You take one, maybe burning fiercely, the whole thing is white colour, glowing in blue. Huh? You take it out by itself, you put it one side. Within minutes, huh? even if it's burning so strongly, it will fizzle out. It will fizzle out because you're alone. But you take maybe, as it were, a few lukewarm ones, huh? still burning, but then not that shining, not that bright, not that blue, not that, to have that heat. You put them together, oh, you see their power. We know when we do barbecues, right? You put them together, when they come together, the heat will increase. And all of them will turn blue, burning, all white. You know, the white and the blue flame, strong and they will last a lot longer together. That's what prayer does. Praying together help us also to discern God's voice. That song was very good. Kenneth gave the first word. Florence came to confirm it. You know, it's not an individual thing. God, the Holy Spirit is the same. It speaks and I think many of us may not have the time to come and share but I think it ministered to many. It ministered to me as well. Praying together help us to discern that the Lord is speaking to us together. If, if there's something wrong later, we also will, hey, that one a bit off. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a corporate thing. Praying together also help us to desire God's purpose. So when you pray alone, uh, no one's here, right? You pray your own things. Uh. <laughs> when you pray together, you're more sensitive. You pray what's the corporate things. We pray for our Archbishop, we pray for our President, we pray for the Church, we pray for corporate things, the desires, larger things of God. See, as a Church, we are called to love one another, serve one another, worship God together. Praying together, ultimately, also very important, is strengthen our discipleship. You know how God sometimes will talk to us? No? See, we are, love, we, are, we are taught, no? we are taught to we are supposed to love everyone. But, I mean, let's be real, huh? It's very hard to like everyone. <laughs> We're all very different, right? So, we may not like everyone, but we are told to love everyone. Uh, love is different. And you still love. Huh? You may not like the person. You know how God sometimes speaks or not? Most likely, sometimes God huh, will speak to us huh, through a person that we don't like. <laughs> That's how God will work. Most of the time, this is how God will work. And then see whether you're humble enough to take it in or not. Nah. That is discipleship. That's why praying together is very important. Coming together. So it's very crucial that as a church, we come together to pray. You know where I'm going. It's coming Friday. Uh, it's our corporate prayer. It's very crucial. Uh, our vicar, Callum Berry, he... He said, no, this is not going to be just an English thing. Well, later I've got to announce it to a Chinese. I've got a harder time. 
is together. English and Chinese will come together this Friday. We're going to pray together as a church, as one church, one united body of Christ to pray and we seek God together, together. So we are all invited. Huh? I will use the words of Christ. All, the banquet ready. You can, all are invited. All are invited to come together physically to align our hearts to God, to pray together as one body, English and Chinese. The vicar himself will lead us. We will pray, hear from God, and ask God how is he going to lead us St. John's Chapel in the years to come. I will close with this. Jesus' task, he got, he got many mission. Mission is done. One of his tasks was to teach his followers to pray. To teach them to pray on earth as in heaven. So our task similarly is to continue to pray and to teach others as well on earth as in heaven. So Lord, may your kingdom come. Let us pray. We pray these familiar words. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.